Um, so good morning, everybody. Thanks all for taking the time out of your agendas this morning. Um, as Nina said, my name is Caroline Paddle. I'm the UK Sales Director for Skybox Security. And today, we're really going to talk about how having a context-aware approach can help you focus in on the priorities that really matter to you and how it can help you stay ahead of the evolving threat landscape. So, Skybox. Our philosophy is that, really, in order to secure an organization, the first and most important thing you need is to have visibility of your attack surface. And we can define your attack surface as your exposure, all the exploitable vulnerabilities, all, in essence, the different ways that you could be compromised and are open to attack. And really, by understanding that, can you start to get proactive, and we can really look to help you contain and prevent attacks. Because this is the challenge, right? You know, when we look at the scale and complexity of today, today's enterprises, this is actually you know, a, a, a depiction of a, an actual enterprise network. And it's no wonder that many organizations are starting to struggle with even some of the security basics. And if we look at this, the, the reality is there's just too many point products, too many technologies that we've deployed over the years. We've got products that really are lacking context of what it is they're actually trying to protect. And we've got um, disjointed security tooling, organizational silos. It's a real challenge. In some of the customers that I talk to, we've got you know, networks, ops, security, don't seem to really be talking to each other. I certainly know a few that don't like each other. So trying to get consistency of approach and, and consistency of, of tool sets across those is, is certainly a challenge. So in those instances, then typically we start to bring in some of the outsourcers. So, you know, we can see that works to varying degrees and, you know, we very often then look to actually give part of that infrastructure to them or maybe put a managed SOC in place. And as we say, that, that does and doesn't work. It's not common, uncommon to see a variety of outsources in large enterprises, um, but also it going out and then only to be brought back in because of misalignment of expectations or deliverables on that. And of course, we've got the ever-increasing push to the cloud as well. So you know, how do you get a single pane of glass view across all of those, in, you know, those environments? Because when we look at that, enterprises today have got tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of ways that they are potentially exploitable and have got vulnerabilities there. So how can we really help you to focus in and see the wood for the trees? Now, if we look in a bit more detail in the vulnerability side of things, there's just a literal flood of vulnerabilities that enterprises are dealing with. This is a screenshot from our vulnerability index uh, from this year. And as you can see, pretty consistently throughout the year, we're seeing between 700 and 1,100 vulnerabilities every month. You know, we actually collate this on, on vulnerabilitycenter.com, so any of you can go and have a look at there. But we have over 25 different security feeds, and we're looking over 1,000 different technologies that are used in enterprises to collate this information. And it's just an overwhelming number that organizations are faced with. And added to that is the fact that you can't just deal with the, with the critical ones either. You know, when we actually speak to organizations, because there's so many, quite typically, uh, and they don't have enough resources, then literally they're focusing on the criticals and the highs, if they can get to them. Very often there's a long tail of vulnerabilities that are just not being addressed in the organization. But there's lots of research out there, including this here from IBM X-Force and Gartner, that's saying, if you're really only dealing with the criticals, then you're missing a lot of the vulnerabilities that actually are leading to exposure. And to rub salt in the wounds even further, it's, uh, it's, it's, oh, you also need to consider older vulnerabilities. Um, you know, here we can see from Verizon, 85% of exploited vulnerabilities were actually more than two years old. There's over 100 that go back a decade. This is not just a zero-day problem that we have. So when we think about vulnerability management um, and we look at that, I mean, this is uh, a, you know, a flexible and responsive vulnerability management program is at the core, at the heart of an information security system. But in many organizations we speak to, that process is, is quite honestly broken. You know, we all know the basics, the fundamentals. You do your preparation, you identify your vulnerabilities, you risk assess it, you prioritize, pack, patch acquisition, patch testing, patch deployment, and then verification. That's, I'll say, Security 101, and we know that, but that's just not happening in many companies that we talk to. 
you know, we're finding that remediation is literally passed like a hot potato around the different silos and different divisions. It's becoming too difficult. And meanwhile, we're missing remediation SLAs, and we've got the auditors constantly kicking us. You know, that's the reality. But sadly, vulnerabilities and their exploitation is still the root cause of most breaches. Now, this is really where we need to be focusing our efforts. This is what leads to the front page headlines very often. So we have to change this. We have to modernize our approach to vulnerability management. Because the one area that is evolving, that is innovating, is the cybercrime industry. Now, there's a great book. I have a copy here if anybody would like to look at it. But it's by Dr. Nir Kachetri. And he's from the University of North Carolina. And he did a focus on the cybercrime industry and really looking at the business models, the economic processes, the entrepreneurial aspects of organizations involved in cybercrime. And he actually says within the book that you know, this is now an industry. It's a, it's a trillion dollar industry, according to some experts, and it's, and it's growing. And actually, if you look at it as an, inter, an industry, some of the, the features that it has, it's not that dissimilar to our own. You know, they have a mixture of large and small companies. They've got vendors and service providers. They extol the same virtues that we have. They're looking at excellence, innovation, <coughs> usability. They offer training and tech support. There's open forum, collaboration, you know, open source, all these sorts of things. And they've got lots of innovative you know, ways to market and advertise and sell their tools and technologies. And there's some great, easy to use products. And I'd love to sell some of this stuff. You know, they, if you look at VDOS as an example, I mean, to say that VDOS is being used in the majority of DDoS attacks over the last two years would be you know, an underestimation. I mean, they, they have done over 150,000 DDoS attacks by some accounts in the last two years. They've generated over 600,000 in revenue. And actually, when you look at it, I mean, just for four months alone last year, between April and July, they were responsible for 277 million seconds of DDoS attacks, or nearly 8.81 years of attack traffic clogging up the internet. And you can buy it in a nice, easy to consume subscription package. You know, here you can have, you know, do you want a, a gold package for $39.99 or the VIP package for $199, madam? You know, it's very nice, simplistic, easy to use um, services that are being offered. Or if you need something a little bit more tailored, then actually the likes of Ransomware 32 are only happy to oblige. Um, here you can actually select um, exactly what your preferences are and how you want this service to work. So, you know, here you can see we, we'd like a payout ratio of 75%. That's not a bad return. And you can actually put the rest of your preferences in place. You know, do you want the lock screen to appear before encrypting? The lock screen got quite a lot of press earlier this year. And, you know, I had an interesting conversation over dinner last night with somebody that was saying they basically had to have a conversation with their... CFO about what bitcoins are and how they need to acquire them and what they go about in that process. That is not a conversation anybody wants to be having. You know, that's not good. Um, but as I say, it's, it's very easy to customize these services. It will ask you for the amount of bitcoins that you want to ask for. And my favorite bit, if you can see it there, it says, don't be too greedy or people will not pay. You know, that's customer service, adding value. I like that. Um, so as I say, it's really easy to just be able to very quickly get these services and throw these attacks out there. And what we're starting to see is that there is a shift from targeted attacks to distributed attacks. You know, targeted attacks will still always happen, and they are happening. You know, if we look at nation state, if we look at what happens to you know, the DNC, and when we see attacks against critical national infrastructure, the power plants in Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera, that's when the victim is important, and that will continue to happen. But for those people who where money is the, the critical factor, where money is most important, we're starting to see them really push into the distributed attacks. And this is really about a quantity rather than quality approach. You know? This is indiscriminate. You know, if we think about, it's not, it's not that many years ago I was talking to organizations about DDoS solutions. And I'd quite often sit down with companies about you know, XYZ service that we could offer. And they say, well, we're not a bank, we're not a household name, we won't be attacked, we're not going to be a target. In today's environment, unfortunately, as we're moving to seeing these distributed attacks, everybody and anybody could be a target today. And ransomware is just quite simply everywhere. 
You know, we're seeing 25 new ransomware families released every quarter. There's clear market leaders with Locky, Cerber, and CryptXX. And we already have seen hundreds of thousands of victims of all shapes and sizes of businesses. And by some estimates, over a billion just exhorted in 2016 alone. You know, this is not going away. <clears throat> Because they're innovating, the cyber criminals out there, this is working for them. You know, our current technology infrastructure and architectures lend themselves very well to distributed attacks. It doesn't take as much effort, so they're making more money. There's a better ROI. This is a pretty good business model, and people are following suit. So they're making some people very, very wealthy. So again, this is not going to stop anytime soon. So taking all of that into consideration, then if we are going to modernize our approach to vulnerability management, we really need to be able to ask ourselves some key questions. So do we know what all of our assets are? Do we know what our environment looks like? Do we know all of our assets and all of our vulnerabilities? Do we know of those assets which are actually exposed? Do we know for which there's exploits, exploits that are publicly available and they're actively out there in the wild? And do we know which exploits are being used in campaigns right now, which are being added to ransomware kits, exploit kits, etc.? Because if you can answer these, if you have a picture of all of these environments, then you can start to say, well, I'll address where I've got exposure and where I've got imminent threat first. And you can start to identify where your priorities should be. Now, we talk, call that approach threat-centric vulnerability management at Skybox. And for us, the starting point is to build out a comprehensive model of your attack surface. So what we would do when modeling your environment is actually start with the security controls. It's a pretty obvious place to start. So we'd look at your firewalls. And at a very granular level, obviously looking at the rule base, access rules, et cetera, et cetera, and how those are architected with the environment. Um, but then we'd start to go further. So we'd then look at all of the layer three devices within the environment. So all of the routers, switches, proxies, load balancers, all of the other stuff that shows how your network is actually architected. And actually, that's a really valuable thing to do anyway. Typically, when we do that, we will find assets that customers just don't know are there. You know, it's easy with mergers and acquisitions and things spinning up left, right, and center to lose track of actually what your environment looks like. And we've actually worked with customers to model their environments just purely as that's the use case they've been looking for. I mean, I'm working with a global retail bank at the moment that's using us to audit all of their global DMZ for third party access. So we're really looking at who's coming in, how they're connecting, how they're traversing the network, what they've got access to. So once we start to look at the underlying network infrastructure, then we'd go a step further. So we will integrate with your CMDBs. Now either you'll have one, you'd like one, it's woefully out of date, or one of the above. Um, but if you have a CMDB or any other sort of asset registers, we can start to pull that information in, look at the key assets, and start to align business attributes to these. Which are the crown jewels? Which are the things that actually matter to you? Which are the things that we need to be protecting? And then as we go further building up our picture, we start to integrate with the wider technology ecosystem. So we'll start to pull in your patch management, your vulnerability scanners, and overlaying that data. So when we look at the vulnerability scanners, you know, you'll be scanning, and as we've said, you'll have this big long list of vulnerabilities. Now what we will do is we'll take that list, but we will lay it over the top of this model. So now we're not just looking at the criticality of a vulnerability, we're looking at, well, where is it located? You know, you might have a critical vulnerability, but it's on a sandbox server or a print server, or you know, it's going nowhere. But you could have a low-lying vulnerability that resides near a critical business system or application, or it's on an exploitable path to the outside world. We need to better risk assess these and see where is the imminent risk, you know, which are the ones we should truly be prioritizing. And then we'll also bring in threat intelligence as well. So bringing in that latest data to see where is the, the immediate risk. So we bring in that data from our research labs. And we've got over 25 different threat feeds that we look to amalgamate and bring into the model. Now, many of you will subscribe to threat feeds as well anyway. Um, but the challenge with that, again, is what do you do with that? What, you know, what, how do you actually relate that and give that context to your own environment? So that's what we're doing. We're bringing in those threat feeds, giving it context. But we're also bringing in data from the dark web as well. So we're looking at where are the exploits in the wild, where are the uh, you know, vulnerabilities being used in ransomware and exploit kits, and what are those attack vector details to, again, give you all of that, that current data about where the threat resides. And this really came into its own when we looked at the events of you know, WannaCry earlier this year. 
So, you know, the Microsoft published the bulletin on March 14, and actually in early April, we could see chatter through our partners at Recorded Future. So we could see that there was noise, there was talk about the, the, the vulnerabilities in Russian hacking forums, cyber criminals were starting to talk about Eternal Blue, you know, as early as April 17th. So we're able to take that data and that knowledge and help our customers better prioritize their remediation efforts. So if we look at how we would help you see where the immediate risk is, you know, within an environment, you've got your potential risk, so you would have all your existing vulnerabilities. But as we build it, we start to help you see where are the immediate ones, what are the few percentage that you need to be remediating right now. So in the WannaCry instance, say March 14th is actually when you know, the bulletin came out. April 18th, we would have told you, you have that vulnerability, and now it has a known exploit. And now it's been exploited in the wild, which it was on April 18th. And we will be able to show you which, based on their exposure within your environment, are the ones in that small percentage that, that are imminent threat to you, a high priority, and you need to be remediating right now. And the WannaCry attack actually went global on March 12th. So we were giving customers you know, almost a month's worth of advance notice to say how you need to prioritize your remediation efforts and get on the front foot. Let's get proactive with our, our vulnerability management. Now, many of you, obviously, at a CISO level, you need a higher level view as well when you're looking at where is the risk across my organization. So we have something called Horizon. And Horizon, really, think of it as a, a visualization layer that sits above that model. Because there's a lot of data in there that can get very complex. And you can organize this however best suits your business. So it can be geographic. It can be based on business entity. It can be you know, legal entity, however you want to organize and structure yourselves. But for this example, let's say we're looking at geographies, so we're looking at the US, and we are looking for what we call indicators of exposure. Now that's a critical concept for Skybox. So we're looking for, you know, where is the potential for exposure? Where are the open doors and windows? A lot of security tooling that you have is looking for indicators of compromise. Something's already happened. There's been an incident, there's been an event, there's already been a trigger. Something's already happened there. So what we're looking to do is, as I say, look at key areas where we can say, let's get proactive to, to, to prevent some of this stuff. So we're looking for risky access rules, uh, insecure device configurations, where have you got exploitable vulnerabilities, where have you got vulnerabilities that have been exploited in the wild, and where have you got exposure to vulnerabilities. And we will show you how that trends, we will show you how you can compare that to different regions, and you can then start to see the detail and say, oh, you know, I've got a load of insecure devices in the US, I can click in, drill down, and kick off some remediation activity about that. So it's about a very high level, red, amber, green status you know, at, at your level to be able to see where have I got risk, in what regions, and what do I need to do about it. The other thing that we can do, you know, it starts to get quite clever, is because we've modeled your entire organization, we can start to effectively war game against this. So when we build the model, you actually have a number of different versions of that, and you have a what-if model. And in that what-if model, you can effectively run attack simulations. So you know, here, we're actually looking at attack path analysis and a bit of a simplified view, but you can see from a third parties, we could look at your third parties, and we can see that actually there's a violating rule that's allowing access into the DMZ. From there, there's a high density of vulnerabilities, and if we can compromise that, we can actually get further ongoing connection, get further into the environment. And actually, over in Moscow, there's a brand new vulnerability, and a compromise on that would lead to you know, a loss of CIA data. And we can show you the entire thread of that, you know, how that attack could happen through your organization, every hop, every step of the way, and we'll tell you how you can prevent that. So can you patch? You may or may not be able to. You might have a lot of legacy apps that you can't do anything with. So what are the mitigating controls? Can you deploy an IPS signature? If so, we'll tell you what IPS signature it is. Is it a firewall rule change? And again, we'll show you what that rule change is and, and how you can prevent that. So we've got lots of different ways that we can help you model where you've got exposure. Again, locking those open doors and windows and getting proactive. And in our advanced customers, this becomes a daily remediation process. It gets built into the SOC. You know, it's really a part of looking at how can I, on an ongoing basis, reduce my risk within the environment. So Skybox is a platform. Uh, we've got five different modules. They're all completely independent of each other. And it really depends you know, where you've got challenges in your own infrastructure as to where's the best starting point for yourself. 
We've talked about kind of the vulnerability and the threat uh, side specifically today, but we also have modules that deal with kind of the firewall audit and compliance, firewall change management and automation of firewalls, and obviously configuration of network devices. And, it, and it's not just the IT stack, it's the OT stack as well, if some of you have got sort of operational technology environments. You know, those are becoming more of a focus for, for a lot of the ha hackers and cyber criminals out there as well. So again, we can pull those into the model for you. And it's not just your on-prem, as we've said, it's, it's out into those third parties and out into those cloud providers as well. So giving you that, that single pane of glass across your environment. But you know, we've all been in security a long time, and I certainly don't believe that there's any single answer, any single silver bullet for all of this. And I think one of our key strengths is actually the way that we can integrate with the rest of your security ecosystem. So kind of think of us as the glue that sits in the middle that pulls a lot of this together. So you know, if we take Seam uh, as an example, the, the, the challenge with Seam Technologies is, you know, years ago we thought that was going to solve all the problems. Um, in reality, there's just data overload. There's just too much noise. They do require a lot of tuning. Um, and it's not really you know, it helped us see where we need to, to prioritize our efforts. What we will do when integrating with Seam is because we understand the landscape, we understand your exposure, where you've got vulnerabilities, we're giving a watch list to those tools. And we're saying, actually, these are the things that we want you to alert on, helping you to focus in and get more leverage out of those solutions. If we look at asset management solutions, again, you may or may not have a CMD, but it's a two-way thing. We can help get a complete view of your assets and your environment and feed that back into the tool sets that you're using. So you start really to get an understanding of, of your environment. We've touched on vulnerability scanners. As I say, you know, we have to scan, we have to understand what are out there, but we need a better way of prioritizing that. So we will give those, those, uh, those uh, better way of prioritizing, looking at exposure and location and other things rather than just criticality. Um, firewalls, um, as I say, we'll deal with the whole change management process of firewalls. But beyond that, actually, if you're going to make a firewall change, are you going to open up a vulnerability? Are you going to cause an exposure by doing a firewall change? So that's why it's important to bring this into part of a, an ecosystem and a total model that's really modeling the impact of any changes that you're making. And IPSs, you know, we all have IPSs. Um, their value is debated, you know, they can be quite costly for what they really give us, but we're, we've all had them for a long time. Um, but actually, let's look at it more as a mitigating control. You know, where we've got things that we can't patch, and we all do, there's legacy apps all over the place, where can we use an IPS? Where can we deploy a signature? How can we get better leverage out of the existing tool sets? Because you've all spent a fortune on security. I really believe a challenge is you've got a lot of the products. It's just the people and process bits around it is where it's falling down. And how can we better integrate these things and help you get more return from them? So we're totally open and agnostic. We integrate with over 120 different technologies. And the list is constantly growing. But if you have something unique to your own environment, then we're very API driven. Um, so we're able to, to, you know, to custom build that. And we've got a team focused on that if you need some particular integrations. So kind of summing up for Skybox, you know, we are a, a global organization. We're headquartered in Silicon Valley. We've actually been around 15 years. So this isn't anything shiny, brand new, just out of Silicon Valley. You know, we've, we've, we've um, continued to grow and evolve during that time and are still attracting lots of funding, actually, which I think is, is testament to our strategy and to the solutions that we have. I think we're in a bit of a, a sweet spot at the moment that our technology actually addresses a lot of the challenges that customers are having today. You know, we continually are looking to lead the market, and, but we're also being recognized as such and, and, and you know, very fortunate to, to have had sort of consecutive five-star reviews in areas such, such as threat and vulnerability management, risk, policy management, etc. And we've got a wealth of customers pretty much across every sector um, you know, today. So we've always done a lot in financial services. Um, and sort of central government and defense, six of the world's NATO SOX users. Um, but actually today, it's pretty much every industry, every sector. You know, they've all got the same challenges around size and scale and complexity, and that's really where we can, we can help them. So my final thought, my uh, VP is actually very, very fond of, of quoting Sun Tzu um, at us, uh, every opportunity. But I think if you do think that you know, what we are facing is a war with cyber criminals, and if you think of your attack surface as that battleground that we're all going to war on each day, then actually, if you know your enemy, if you know yourself, then you need not uh, fear the result of 100 battles.
Thank you very much.